Hello, it's, uh, I'm Chris Carlisle and today I've got the pleasure of having a chat to Philip Byrne. Phil was Commodore in 2008 to 10, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, hi Phil. Hello Chris, how are you? <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> hey, uh, before we get to talking about the Yacht Club and everything, am I right in understanding that you are one of the very few people qualified to play the big organ at the City Hall? Oh, Is that don't... correct? Well, not, not particularly qualified. I am an amateur musician and uh, I've certainly played the city, the Melbourne Town Hall organ once or twice, uh, but most of the time I, the playing I did was at St Andrews Brighton. St Andrews Brighton, yeah, which is I imagine the very few people know that about you. Yeah, probably. So, <laughs> <laughs> and your weirder. whole career has really been in the music industry, yes, hasn't it? Yes, um, yes. Yeah. Yamaha? Originally with Yamaha Music and, and then, then I got, in, got into my own business and uh, yeah, now Almost retired. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Well, uh, tell us about your experiences at Sandringham. When did you join and what did you do and so forth? I joined in 1963. My father had uh, bought a, an old fishing boat which was out on a swinging mooring here. And uh, I think it was probably Dad suggested it'd be a good idea to get involved in the cadets, which I did. I, I'm a, not a good sailor. Never have been, never will be. Um, but I did get a fair bit out of it. There was a bloke who ran the juniors in those days uh, called Bruce Rayward, and he was as interested in teaching the kids seamanship as he was sailing. Yep. And uh, I learned a lot from him and how to handle motorboats and that sort of thing. And I ended up actually driving the rescue boats and uh, uh, running races, so at a fairly early age. Probably a, uh, a little different career path than many at the Yacht Club oh, here. Oh, completely, yeah. And, uh, you're now, as I understand it, you're now on the dark side. Can you tell us about what would possibly persuade a person to go that route? Well, there are a lot of motor boaties in the club, Chris. You know, I'm not alone. And it would be fair to say that I'm a long-term motor boatie more than a long-term yachtsman. I've tended to keep the boats down at uh, Meetung over the years because we've got a holiday house down there and the cruising grounds are great. Um, I bought the current boat, which is a Grand Banks 42, with the ambition to take it down to Tasmania and do some cruising around the east coast there, Dontracasto Channel, etc. Um, so I think it was you actually who said to me, "There's a there's a rule regarding taking motorboats in the ocean. You've got to have two engines. It's got to be at least 40 feet." So I followed that up, got myself a Grand Banks 42. Beautiful boat. Uh, yeah, lovely boat. boat. And uh, I took it down to Tasmania for six months, about six years ago and it's just stayed there. I just never got around to bringing it back. Where do you keep it? Down? In the Derwent or down the... Yeah, in the Derwent at uh, uh, Motor Yacht Club of Tasmania. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. At Lindisfarne. Yeah. Close to the airport, very handy. Oysters at Bruny Island for lunch, eh? Uh, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Get couldn't, shucked, that's couldn't the place. Be <laughs> couldn't be better. <laughs> now, you're a long-time treasurer at Sandringham mm. and in your time, it would be fair to say that we've been... We've seen the highs and the lows mm. financially. Yeah. Tell us a bit about both the highs and the lows. Probably the lows were the start of it. Yeah, the lows the were the start of it. Uh, I had got onto general committee as club captain off the beach in Graham Ainley's time. And that coincided uh, with us put, building the marina. And of course, you will recall that the yacht club used to get a stream of income from the old timber marina. And that clearly was going to dry up because they were financing the marina through selling long-term licenses. And so the club was left with a cash shortfall, to be per perfectly frank. And the solution to that, which was a quite a valid conclusion at the time, I thought, was to put pokey machines into the club. And that was based on the experience in New South Wales where clubs had had a wonderful, including yacht clubs, mm. had done very nicely out of a relatively modest number of poker machines, but it provided a very stable source of revenue. They are only just being rolled out in Victoria at that time, so there's no history in Victoria. And so we duly put in the poking machines. I think we took out a $250,000 loan with NAB to fund the refurbishment of the clubhouse to accommodate them. And they never worked. And we were not alone in that. Lots of places in Victoria uh, fell foul, it didn't work with the pokies and uh, caused them all sorts of financial pain and we weren't alone. But I do hasten to add, you know, at the, at the time, I think it was a pretty logical decision. Mm. It's just it did not work out. Yeah. So we found ourselves really in a position, if you define technically bankrupt as not being able to meet your commitments as and when they fall due, <laughs> we were right there. Sounds like a pretty good low to me. <laughs> yeah, we were right there. <laughs> so 
so it was very did, challenging. How long did it take to dig out of that situation? Probably six or seven years. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it took a long time. I think the turning point was putting a professional manager into the place, yeah. in Scott Eccleston. Yep. Um, he, well, he found a lot of, uh, shall we say, irregularities in the running of the business, with particularly in the hospitality side, plugged those holes. That improved our, our financial position dramatically. And, you know, we, I think we've been very lucky in this place to have two outstanding chief executive officers over 25 years in Scott and Richard Hewitt. I remember being uh, in the treasurer's spot uh, when Lou Abrahams was Commodore and Fred Payne was the secretary. Yeah, yeah. And Fred, uh, Fred was a remarkable old character. His, the desk, he'd, he'd have a pile of papers. I remember him going through looking for something one day and found yesterday's sandwiches or last month's, <laughs> last month's sandwiches <laughs> in the... But, um, but as you say, Scott, followed by Richard, um, really put the place on a very professional footing. Yeah, yeah. And then, so, from the low to the high, what, what would you say was the high point? Financially? Yeah. Oh, the, the high point, I think, is about now, really. We've got the marina licences coming back yeah. to us yeah. and uh, that takes an enormous amount of pressure off the club. Yeah. We've repaid all of the debt in, yeah. in this building uh, and in every other project that's been held around the club. I distinctly remember Graham Ainley trying to convince me to be Treasury, said, Philip, in the long term, the club will be swimming in cash. As soon as those marina licences come back, yep. we're made. And I think today is the high point. Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly a long way from where you started. Yeah, yeah. So what other recollections do you have of your, what, 50 odd years as a member of Sandringham? Well, I, I, I haven't been a, an official member for that 50 years because I had a break in between. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> I committed the heinous crime of resigning from Sandringham and joining Royal Brighton. I did hear that, but I wasn't going to raise it. <laughs> well, it was circumstantial. Dad couldn't get a mooring here, so he, he was able to get one at, at Royal yeah. Brighton. So we shifted up there. So I joined the club there for a period. And then the inevitable happened. You know, kids come along, all these sorts of things. You drop out for a period. I only really became involved back at Sandringham when my eldest child, Andrew, wanted to play around in boats. Well, he's certainly so, done that, hasn't he? <laughs> well, yes, he has, yeah. He's got a career out of it. Yeah. But uh, He was the chief pilot at Gladstone at one stage, wasn't he? No, not the chief pilot. He's one of the pilots of the pilot, at Gladstone. Yeah. And, and uh, he's now pilot in Hobart. All right, yeah. So, um, so he keeps an eye on your boat. Probably lives on your boat, does he? We, no, he, he did live on, on it for a period when he first went down to Hobart. And he said, Dad, I can tell you, living on a boat is terrible. It's awful. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, no, he doesn't live on it. The one story that you haven't broached, which I can't let you out without raising it, there was a little wooden boat here, which everyone thought should be written off, but you actually bought and paid real money for. Not much. Not much. <laughs> and then I believe it sat in a field somewhere around... Oh, not Trentham. Painful. Trentham, yeah, yeah, Trentham, and had an enormous amount of work done on it. And you tried to sell it for... Is it 150000 or something? Oh, no, 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 no. That it owed you? <laughs> that it owed you. That's what it owed us. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, a case of uh, a child's good idea and mummy's and daddy's m money. <laughs> Dad, I've got a proposition for you. Annabelle's for sale. <laughs> I said, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> and I was assured... He actually got the chief engineer from... The, he was working on the Spirit of Tasmania at the time, his chief officer there, and he got the chief engineer down who told us that the engine was fine. Well, once we pulled the engine out, there was more uh, salt water in the gearbox than there was oil, yeah. and the engine was entirely seized. So what, how the hell he thought it was going to be a goer, I have no idea. Anyway, we bought the thing. Mercifully, the bloke who did the work on it was the shipwright on the Spirit of Tasmania, oh, yeah. and he uh, had been a, an apprentice with Pompey's, just loved working on timber boats. Yeah. Perfect. And so it was almost a, uh, you know, bit, bit almost therapeutic for him to be doing that work rather than what he'd do on the Spirit of Tasmania. And uh, he, Andrew spent hours and hours and hours on it. Now, how much was actually working on the boat and how much was he and Scotty drinking? I've got no idea, but, you know, yeah. there you go. Yeah. So what's yeah. up to Annabelle now? Well, she's come back to the club. Yeah. Barry Reid's bought her. And we're thrilled with that because Andrew was very distraught at the idea of selling it, but... Quite simply, it just wasn't get, getting used. It was just sitting in the pen at Meetung. And uh, Andrew's now living in Hobart, not likely to move from there in the near future. And uh, 
And so we put it on the market and within hours, Barry was on the blower and bought the boat. Yeah, oh, and, perfect. And we're just thrilled that it's yeah. come back to someone who'll love her perfect. after all the work's been put into her. If you look ahead, I don't know, five, ten years, how do you see the future in terms of your boating experiences? Uh, Any great plans or great visions? No, not really. I'm, I'm tossing up, do I keep the Grand Banks or do I get something, a smaller fishing boat that I can just handle by myself no, or something like one. that? Um, I'm not sure. Jane and I were only debating that last night, actually. Yeah. Take it up north where the weather's Oh, warm. no, I wouldn't take her up north, no. No, <laughs> no air conditioning on it. <laughs> it's got a heater, but no air conditioning. Well, that's a fascinating uh, run-through of your time at Sandringham before and hopefully after. And I hope you get down to Tasmania more often. Thanks, Chris. So thank you, Phil. Thanks thank you very much. Being part.